Why do constipated women appear to be at higher risk for breast cancer? Results suggest a slight increased risk of breast cancer for both decreased frequency of bowel movements and firm stool consistency. Whereas women who have three or more bowel movements a day— I call them super poopers, sounds like an ABBA song— <laughs> appear to cut their risk of breast cancer in half. This could be because constipation means a greater contact time between our waist and our intestinal wall, which may increase the formation and absorption of fecal mutagens, substances that cause DNA mutations and cancer, into the circulation, and that could end up in the breast tissue. This concept dates back more than a century, where severe constipation, so-called chronic intestinal stasis, was sometimes dealt with surgically. Figuring that the colon was an inessential part of the human anatomy, why not cure constipation by just cutting it out? What they noted, though, was that potentially precancerous changes in the breasts of constipated women seemed to disappear after the surgery. It would take another 70 years, though, before researchers followed up on the clues by those distinguished surgeons who claimed that breast pathology cleared when constipation was corrected. So they investigated the relation between potentially precancerous changes in the breast and the frequency of bowel movements in nearly 1,500 women. They found four times the risk in women reporting two or fewer bowel movements a week compared to more than once daily, who had the lowest risk. We know that even the non-lactating breast actively takes up chemical substances from the blood, so maybe substances originating in the colon might enter the bloodstream and reach the breast. We know there are mutagens in feces, so it's not unreasonable to suggest that potentially toxic substances derived from the colon have damaging or even carcinogenic effects upon the lining of the breast. And those toxic substances may be bile acids. First shown to promote tumors in mice in 1940, subsequent experiments on rat led to the mistaken belief that bile acids just promoted existing cancers, but couldn't actually initiate tumors themselves. However, there's a fundamental difference between rodent models and human cancer. Rats only live a few years, and so the opportunity for cancer-causing mutations may be at least 30 times greater in humans. Now we have at least 15 studies showing that bile acids can damage DNA, strongly suggesting that they can initiate new cancers as well. Bile acids are formed as a way of getting rid of excess cholesterol. Our liver dumps bile acids into the intestine for disposal, assuming our intestines will be packed with fiber to trap it and flush it out of the body. But if we haven't been eating whole plant foods all day, bile acids can be reabsorbed back into the body and build up in the breast. Carcinogenic bile acids are found concentrated in the fluid of breast cysts at up to 100 times the level found in the bloodstream. They just uh, kind of suck it up and concentrate it. By radioactively tagging bile acids, they were able to show that intestinal bile acids rapidly gain access to the breast, where they can exert an estrogen-like cancer-promoting effect on breast tumor cells. This would explain why we see 50% higher bile acid levels in the bloodstream of newly diagnosed breast cancer victims. These findings support the concept of a relationship between intestinally derived bile acids and the risk of breast cancer. So how can we facilitate the removal of bile acids from our body? Well, we can speed up the so-called oral-anal transit time, the speed at which food goes from mouth to toilet, because slowed colonic transit can increase bile acid absorption. Now we can do this by eating lots of fiber. A diet packed with plants greatly increases bile acid excretion. Fiber can bind up and remove toxic elements like lead and mercury, as well as cholesterol and bile acids. But plants can bind bile acids even independent of fiber. Vegan diets, for example, bind significantly more bile acids than lacto-ovo or non-vegetarian diets, even at the same fiber intake, which could explain why it appears that individuals eating vegetarian might excrete less mutagenic feces in the first place. To lower the risk of diet and lifestyle-related premature degenerative diseases, and to advance human nutrition research, relative bile acid binding potential of foods needs to be evaluated, since if bile acids are absorbed back into the system, they may increase cancer risk. 
some vegetables bind bile acids better than others. We know that those eating plant-based diets are at lower risk for heart disease and cancer, which could in part be because of phytonutrients in plants that act as antioxidants and potent stimulators of natural detoxifying enzymes in our bodies. They can also lower cholesterol and detoxify harmful metabolites, functions that can be predicted by their ability to bind bile acids so as to remove them from our body. This group of researchers discovered three important things. First, an over five-fold variability in bile acid binding among various vegetables that had similar fiber content, indicating that the bile acid binding is not necessarily related to the total dietary fiber content, but instead to some combination of unique phytonutrients yet to be determined. Second, they found that steaming significantly improves the bile acid binding of collards, kale, mustard greens, broccoli, peppers, and cabbage, as well as beets, eggplant, asparagus, carrots, green beans, and cauliflower, suggesting steaming vegetables may be more healthful than those consumed raw. And finally, they determined which vegetables kick the most bile binding butt. Turnips turn up last. Then comes cabbage, cauliflower, bell pepper, spinach, asparagus, and green beans, beaten out by mustard greens and broccoli. Then basically tying for the number five slot, eggplant, carrots, and Brussels sprouts. Then coming in as the number four best bile binder, collard greens, and then left we have beets, kale, and okra left in the running. Any guesses as to number one? Kale only gets the bronze. Kale surprisingly got beet. Beets get the gold. Inclusion of all these vegetables in our daily diets should be encouraged uh, both papers ended basically the same way. Our two leading killers are to a large extent preventable by appropriate diet and lifestyle modifications, such as eating these vegetables, which, when consumed regularly, may lower the risk of premature degenerative diseases and improve public health. The effects of a vegetarian diet on systemic diseases like cancer, diabetes, and heart disease have been studied and revealed predominantly less systemic diseases in vegetarians. But there have only been a few studies on oral health, which I covered in previous videos. But what's the latest? In a study of 100 vegetarians compared to 100 non-vegetarians, the vegetarians had better periodontal conditions, less signs of inflammation like gum bleeding, less periodontal damage, and better dental home care, uh, brushing and flossing 2.17 times a day compared to 2.02 times a day. Not much of a difference, so maybe it was something about their diet, though vegetarians may have a healthier lifestyle overall beyond just avoiding meat. They control for smoking, but other things like obesity can adversely affect oral health, so there may be confounding factors. What we need is an interventional study where they take people eating the standard Western diet, improve their diets, and see what happens. But no such study existed until now. With professional support of nutritionists, the participants of the study with existing periodontal disease changed their dietary patterns to so-called wholesome nutrition, a diet emphasizing veggies, fruits, whole grains, potato, potatoes, beans, peas, lentils, spices, with water as the preferred beverage. What a concept. To make sure any changes they witnessed were due to the diet, they made sure everyone maintained their same oral hygiene before and after the dietary change. What did they find? They found that eating healthier appeared to lead to a significant reduction of probing pocket depth, uh, gingival inflammation, gum inflammation, and levels of inflammatory cytokines, which mediate the tissue destruction in periodontal disease. So maybe concluded that wholesome nutrition may improve periodontal health. Why, though? Yes, plant-based diets have a number of nutritional benefits in terms of uh, nutrient density, but it also may be about improving the balance between free radicals and our antioxidant defense system. 
Traditionally, dietary advice for oral health was just about avoiding sugar, which feed the bad bacteria on our teeth. But now we realize some foods and beverages, like green tea, possess antimicrobial properties to combat the plaque-producing bacteria directly. Streptococcus mutans has been identified as oral enemy number one. If plaque is caused by bacteria, though, why not just use antibiotics? Many such attempts have been made. However, undesirable side effects such as antibiotic resistance, vomiting, diarrhea, and teeth stains have precluded their use. In a petri dish, green tea phytonutrients effectively inhibited the growth of these bacteria. But what about in our mouth? They found that rinsing with green tea strongly inhibited the growth of plaque bacteria on our teeth within minutes. Seven minutes after swishing with green tea, the number of these bacteria in the plaque scraped from people's teeth was cut nearly in half. So if you have people swish with sugar water in their mouths, within three minutes the pH on their teeth can drop into the cavity formation danger zone. But if 20 minutes before swishing with that sugar water, you swish with some green tea, you wipe out so many plaque bacteria that the same sugar water hardly has any effect at all. So they conclude using green tea as a mouthwash or adding it to toothpaste could be a cost-effective cavity prevention measure, especially in developing countries, because here in the civilized world we have antiseptic mouthwashes with fancy chemicals like chlorhexidine considered the gold standard anti-plaque agent, if only it didn't cause genetic damage. DNA damage has been detected in individuals who rinse their mouths with chlorhexidine-containing mouthwashes, and not just to cells in the mouth. 13 volunteers rinsed their mouth with the stuff for a few weeks, and there was not only an increase in DNA damage in the cells lining their cheeks, but also in their peripheral blood cells, suggesting it was absorbed into their bodies. Yes, it reduced plaque better than other antiseptic chemicals. However, it might be doubtful whether chlorhexidine can still be considered the gold standard when considering how toxic it is to human cells. So are we left with having to decide between effectiveness or safety? How about a head-to-head -head test between chlorhexidine and green tea? Green tea worked better than chlorhexidine at reducing plaque. So using green tea as a mouthwash may work cheaper, safer, and better. And if as a bonus you want to sprinkle some amla powder into it, dried Indian gooseberry powder, it evidently shows an outstanding cavity-stopping potential, not by killing off the bacteria like green tea, but just by suppressing the bacteria's plaque-forming abilities. Here's how much plaque is formed without amla, Here's how much is formed with. Between 1940 and 1971, the synthetic estrogen DES was prescribed to several million pregnant women with a promise that would help prevent miscarriages. Problems were first highlighted in 1953, when it became clear that not only was DES ineffective, it might actually be harmful. However, a powerful and emotive advertising campaign ensured that its use continued until 1971, when it was found to cause cancer of the vagina in the daughters of the mothers who took it. DES was also used to stunt the growth of girls who were predicted to grow abnormally tall. As one pediatric textbook put it in 1968, excessive tallness in girls can be a handicap. It provides difficulty in purchase of smart clothes. The victim is ineligible for certain sought-after professional positions, such as airline hostess, and poses problems in selecting suitable dancing partners. But most people don't know that the greatest usage of DES was by the livestock industry, improving feed conversion in cattle and chickens. Within a year of approval, it was fed to millions of farm animals, and although it was shown to be a human carcinogen in 1971, it was not until 1979 that all use of DES in the meat industry was banned. Now they just use uh, different uh, synthetic estrogen implants, but even now, decades after DES was banned, we're still seeing the effects, an elevation of birth defects even down into the third generation. Arsenic is another human carcinogen that was fed to chickens, this time by the billions. 
the arsenic ends up not only in the meat, as I've talked about previously, but also in the feathers, which are fed back to the animals. See, a third of the bird is inedible. What do they do with billions of pounds of heads, bones, guts, and feathers? Fertilizer and animal feed. Feather meal is fed back to chickens, pigs, cows, sheep, and fish. Now, straight feathers are not particularly nutritious, so uh, guts, heads, and feet may be added for a little extra protein, and manure added to the feed for minerals. The problem is that feather meal used as animal feed could contribute to additional arsenic exposure in persons who consume meat. This gave researchers an idea, though. Uh, by testing feather meal, they might be able to find out what else chickens are fed. Feather meal, a previously unrecognized route for re-entry into the food supply of multiple pharmaceuticals and personal care products. All samples tested positive for antibiotic-type drugs, between 2 to 10 different kinds in each sample, including fluoroquinolones, which have been banned for years. So either the poultry industry is illegally still using the stuff, or it's being used in some other animals fed to the chickens. Regardless, when the feather meal is fed back to the chickens, they are getting exposed to this drug, which is against the law to feed the chickens creating a cycle of re-exposure to banned drugs. Then it just gets weirder. The feathers turned up with half a dozen other drugs— Prozac, antihistamine, fungicide, a sex hormone, and caffeine. Why doesn't the poultry industry just say no? Evidently, the antihistamines are to combat the respiratory problems from packing in so many tens of thousands into the, into the confinement sheds, and the caffeine helps keep the chickens awake so that they eat more and grow faster. The Global Burden of Disease study, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is the most comprehensive and systematic analysis of the causes of death undertaken ever involving nearly 500 researchers from more than 300 institutions in 50 countries, starting out with almost 100,000 data sources. What did they find? Here in the U.S., they determined our number one killer was our diet. Number one on their list of the most important dietary risks, not eating enough fruit, responsible for millions of deaths a year around the world. The Union of Concerned Scientists laid it out. A set of dangerous, often lethal illnesses continue to wreak havoc in the United States. Hundreds of thousands of Americans laid to waste, yet there's a straightforward way to reduce the rates of these eminently preventable disorders, including stroke and heart disease. One antidote for individuals is easy, painless, even pleasurable. Exploit the protective benefits of fruits and vegetables. If Americans increase their consumption of fruits and vegetables just to meet the dietary recommendations, that alone could save the lives of over 100,000 people every year in the United States. That's if we just reach the minimum. But how? Well, one way may be because of their antiplatelet effects. Platelets are what triggers the blood clots that cause heart attacks and most strokes but beyond their obvious function in blood clotting, platelets are now considered to play a pivotal inflammatory role in the hardening of our arteries in the first place, as well as allergies, rheumatoid arthritis, and even cancer. Now, it's important to realize that normally, under healthy conditions, platelets circulate in a quiescent, dormant, inactive state. But once they become activated, they can emerge as culprits in inflammation. Platelets transport a vast amount of inflammatory chemicals. Upon activation, they release these chemicals, which can recruit the inflammatory cells that form the, the pus pockets within our arterial walls that can burst and kill us. This involvement of platelet activation in atherosclerosis development is well established. We've long recognized the platelet's role in the final stages. However, a growing body of data indicates that platelets may also play an important role in the initiation and propagation of atherosclerosis in the first place, which is our nation's leading killer. So, 
How can we prevent the excessive activation of platelets? Well, it's generally recognized that platelet hyperreactivity is associated with high levels of cholesterol circulating in our blood. So we can cut down on foods that have trans fats, saturated fats, and dietary cholesterol. And we can eat more fruits and vegetables. For example, different varieties of strawberries have shown a significant antiplatelet effect in a petri dish and in people. Um, here's how they figured it out. This is a platelet in a resting state, packed with little round granule grenades of inflammatory chemicals, which fuse together when the platelet gets activated and the delivery system dilates before it releases its payload. Because resting and activated platelets look so different, you can just take blood from people and count how many are resting and how many are activated. Before and after, people eat more than a pint of strawberries every day for a month, and there's a small but significant drop in the percentage of activated platelets circulating throughout their bodies after the strawberries. Other berries had a similar effect, and at a more modest two servings a day. Drinking orange or grapefruit juice did not seem to help, but purple grape juice did successfully reduce platelet activity on the same order that aspirin does. Uh, studies have shown a daily aspirin can reduce heart attacks and strokes. However, aspirin can also cause severe gastrointestinal disturbances and bleeding problems, so should not be used for primary prevention of heart attacks and stroke as the benefits don't clearly outweigh the serious risks. So it's nice to have a safe, side-effect-free alternative. When I used to teach medical students at Tufts, I gave a lecture about this amazing new therapeutic called Ilacor B. I talked about all the new signs, all the things it could do, excellent safety profile, and just as they were all scrambling to buy stock in the company and prescribe it to all their patients, I did the big reveal, apologizing for my dyslexia. I had gotten it backwards. All this time, I had been talking about broccoli. Sulforaphane is thought to be the active ingredient in broccoli, which may protect our brain, protect our eyesight, protect our from free radicals, induce our detoxification enzymes, help prevent cancer, as well as help treat it. For example, I've uh, talked about how sulforaphane uh, can target breast cancer stem cells. Uh, but then I talked about how the formation of this compound is like a chemical flare reaction requiring the mixing of a precursor compound with an enzyme in broccoli, which is destroyed by cooking. This may explain why we get dramatic suppression of cancer cell growth from raw broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, but hardly anything from boiled, microwave, or steamed, except for microwave broccoli that actually retained some cancer-fighting abilities. But who wants to eat raw Brussels sprouts? I shared a strategy, though, for how to get the benefits of raw in cooked form. In raw broccoli, when the sulforaphane precursor, called glucoraphanin, mixes with the enzyme, called myrosinase, because you chopped or chewed it, Given enough time, sitting in your upper stomach, for example, waiting to get digested, sulforaphane is born. Now, the precursor is resistant to heat, and so is the final product. But the enzyme is destroyed, and with no enzyme, there's no sulforaphane production. That's why I described the hack-and-hold technique. Right? If you chop the broccoli, Brussels sprouts, or kale, collards, cauliflower first, and then wait 40 minutes, then you can cook them all you want. The sulforaphane is already made. The enzyme has already done its job, so you don't need it anymore. When most people make broccoli soup, for example, they're doing it wrong. Most people cook the broccoli first, then blend it. But now we know it should be done the exact opposite way. Blend it first, wait, then cook it. What if we're using frozen broccoli, though? Here's the amount of sulforaphane found in someone's body after the broccoli soup made from fresh broccoli. Hits their bloodstream within minutes. Here's after frozen. Commercially produced frozen broccoli lacks the ability to form sulforaphane because vegetables are blanched, flash-cooked, 
before they're frozen for the very purpose of deactivating enzymes. This prolongs shelf life in the frozen food section, but the enzyme is dead by the time you take it out of your freezer, so it doesn't matter how much you chop it or how long you wait, no sulforaphane is going to be made. This may be why you know, fresh kale suppresses cancer cell growth up to 10 times more than frozen. The frozen is still packed with the precursor. Remember, that's heat resistant and they could make lots of sulforaphane out of the frozen broccoli by adding some exogenous enzyme, but uh, where are you going to get some myrosinase enzyme from? Now, they bought theirs at a chemical company, but we can just walk into any grocery store. This is another cruciferous vegetable, mustard greens. All cruciferous vegetables have this enzyme. Mustard greens grow out of little mustard seeds, which you can buy ground up in the spice aisle as mustard powder. So if you sprinkled some mustard powder on your cooked frozen broccoli, would it start churning out sulforaphane? We didn't know until now. Boiling broccoli prevents the formation of any significant levels of sulforaphane due to the inactivation of the enzyme. However, Addition of powdered mustard seeds to the heat processed broccoli significantly increased the formation of sulforaphane. Here's the amount of sulforaphane in boiled broccoli. This is how much you get if you add a teaspoon of mustard powder. That's a lot, though. How about a, just a half teaspoon? Worked about just as well, suggesting maybe we could use even less. Domestic cooking leads to enzyme inactivation of myrosinase and hence stops sulfur sulforaphane uh, formation. But addition of powdered mustard seeds to cooked cabbage family vegetables provides a natural source of the enzyme, and then it's like you're practically just eating it raw. So if you forget to chop your greens in the morning for the day, or are using frozen, just sprinkle some mustard powder out on the top at the dinner table, and you're all set. Or some daikon radish, or horseradish, or wasabi, all cruciferous vegetables packed with the enzyme. Here they just use like a quarter teaspoon for seven cups of broccoli, so just a tiny pinch can do it. Or you can add a small amount of fresh greens to your cooked greens, right? because the, the fresh greens have that enzyme that can go to work on the precursor in the cooked greens. One of the first things I used to do in the morning is chop my greens for the day, and so when lunch and supper rolls around, they're good to go, as per the hack and hold strategy. But now with the mustard powder plan, I don't have to pre-chop. Back in the 50s, it was suggested that some cases of constipation among children might be due to the consumption of cow's milk, but it wasn't put to the test until 40 years later. We used to think that most chronic constipation in infants and young children was all in their head. They were anal retentive or had some intestinal disorder. But these researchers studied 27 consecutive infants who showed up in their pediatric gastroenterology clinic with chronic idiopathic constipation, meaning they had no idea what was causing it, and tried removing cow milk protein from their diet. Within three days, 21 out of the 27 children were cured. Symptoms completely regressed when cow's milk protein-free diets were used, and there was a clinical relapse during two subsequent cow milk challenges, meaning they then tried to give them back some cow's milk, and the constipation reappeared within 24 to 48 hours. And they did that twice. Same result. They stuck with the milk-free diet, came back a month later, and they stayed cured, and their eczema and wheezing went away too. The researchers concluded that many cases of chronic constipation in young children, more than three-quarters it seemed, may be due to an underlying cow's milk protein allergy. Chronic constipation is a common problem in children, for which fiber and laxatives are prescribed. If that doesn't work, several laxatives at progressively higher doses can be used, and that still may not work. Five years later, a considerable number of kids still suffering. In fact, it may even extend into adulthood. So to cure the disease in just a few days by eliminating cow's milk was a real breakthrough. Uh, but uh, it was an open study, meaning not blinded, not placebo-controlled, until this landmark study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, a double-blind crossover study, cow's milk versus soy milk. 65 kids 
suffering from chronic constipation, all previously treated with laxatives without success. 49 had anal fissures and inflammation and swelling. An anal fissure is where there's a rip or tear in the anus, very painful. Uh, they gave them either cow's milk or soy milk for two weeks, and then switched it around. So what happened? In two-thirds of the children, constipation resolved while they were receiving soy milk, and the anal fissures and pain were cured, whereas none of the children receiving cow's milk had a positive response. In the 44 responders, the relation with cow's milk protein hypersensitivity was confirmed in all cases by a double-blind challenge with cow's milk. All those lesions, including the most severe anal fissures, disappeared on a cow's milk-free diet, yet reappeared within days after the reintroduction of cow's milk back into their diet. This may explain why children drinking more than a cup of milk a day may have eight times the odds of developing an anal fissure. Cutting out cow's milk may help cure anal fissures in adults, too, uh, but then give them some cow's milk challenge, and their pain goes from zero back up to eight or nine on a scale of one to ten. As I said, very painful. Cow's milk may also be a major contributor to recurrent diaper rash as well. Why, though? Well, all the studies looking at biopsy tissue samples in patients with chronic constipation because of cow's milk protein hypersensitivity have signs of rectal inflammation. Bottom line, for all children with constipation who do not respond to treatment, a trial of elimination of cow's milk should be considered. Studies from around the world have subsequently confirmed these findings, curing up to 80% of kids' constipation by switching to soy milk or rice milk. A common problem with the studies, though, is that when they switched kids from cow's milk to non-dairy milk, the kids could still have been eating other dairy products. They didn't control the background diet until now. 2013 study got constipated kids off all dairy, and 100% were cured, uh, compared with the 68% in the New England Journal study, where the background diet was unrestricted. In fact, in that original study 20 years ago, the cow milk was replaced by soy milk or ass milk. Either was better than cow milk, but no mammary milk at all may be best. Multiple studies published over the last two decades suggest that exercise can mitigate the deleterious effects of age on immune function, thus increasing anti-cancer immunity, in part by stimulating natural killer cell activity. Natural killer cells, a part of our immune system, uh, were to eliminate both tumor cells and virus-infected cells, and we can boost their activity with physical activity. Here's the difference in natural killer cell activity between women involved in athletic competitions compared to their sedentary counterparts. There is a growing consensus that natural killers appear to be the immune system component that is most responsive to the effects of both acute and chronic exercise across the board, from older women to younger men. Significantly higher NK activity in racing cyclists in their 20s. Even just moderate exercise, though, like daily walking, appears to significantly improve NK activity within six weeks. This may be why exercise helps protect against cancer. But sustained vigorous exercise may actually impair natural killer cell immunity, which may be one reason endurance athletes like marathon runners may appear to be more likely to get upper respiratory tract infections. In an upcoming video on preserving athletic immunity with chlorella, I feature a study that showed consuming chlorella appeared to prevent the loss in immune function as measured by antibody production. But what effect might the green algae have on natural killer cell activity? Petri dish and uh, animal studies suggest that the algae chlorella could affect natural killer cell activity, but there is no direct evidence for the effect of chlorella supplementation on such a response in humans until this randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial gave people about two teaspoons of chlorella a day for six weeks, and compared to placebo, they got a significant increase in natural killer cell activities. Does this actually translate, though, into clinical benefits? We didn't know until now. 
the efficacy of chlorella supplementation in adults with chronic hepatitis C infection. It's estimated that up to 4 million people in the U.S. have chronic hepatitis C virus infection, the leading cause of liver transplants, and estimated to kill a quarter million Americans this decade. The current treatment is costly and brutal, uh, costing up to about $85,000, and nearly half can't even complete the course of drugs, due in part to the many complications associated with the treatment. So that's why there's such a need for novel treatment options. After three months of chlorella, there were reported improvements in quality of life, but that could have just been a placebo effect since the control group wasn't given like green sugar pills. This, however, is harder to explain. A significant improvement in ALT, which is a, a marker of liver inflammation, which could be explained by beneficial immunostimulatory effect of chlorella supplementation. No serious adverse effects are reported, so why not give it a try? Well, the brand they used was tied to a disturbing case report recently, chlorella-induced psychosis. A 48-year-old woman in Omaha suffers a psychotic break out of the blue two months after starting chlorella. They stopped it and started her on an antipsychotic drug, and a week later she was fine. Now, chlorella has never been linked to psychosis before, so presumably it was just a coincidence that the psychosis started after she started taking chlorella, and the reason she felt better after stopping it was because the drug was kicking in. But seven weeks later, still on the drug, she became psychotic again after starting back on the chlorella. They stopped the chlorella again, this time that's all they did, and the psychosis resolved. Now, maybe it wasn't the chlorella itself, but some toxic impurity or adulteration, we don't know. While chlorella is marketed to promote mental health, this case underscores the importance of educating the public about the potential adverse effects and the need for more research in herbal products being marketed here in the United States. In 1980, researchers in England reported a series of women who suffered from chronic diarrhea that resolved on a gluten-free diet, yet did not have evidence of celiac disease the autoimmune disorder associated with gluten intolerance. The medical profession was skeptical at the time, and even 30 years later. So much so that, much like patients who had irritable bowel syndrome, patients claiming non-celiac gluten sensitivity were commonly referred to psychiatrists because they were believed to have an underlying mental illness. Psychological testing of such patients, however, found no evidence that they were suffering from some kind of psychosomatic hysteria. The medical profession has a history of dismissing diseases as all in people's heads. Uh, PTSD, ulcerative colitis, migraines, ulcers, asthma, Parkinson's, MS. Despite resistance from the prevailing medical community at the time, these health problems have subsequently been confirmed to be credible physiologically-based disorders rather than psychologically-based confabulations. On the flip side, the Internet is rife with unsubstantiated claims about gluten-free diets, which has spilled over into the popular press to make gluten the diet villain du jour, with claims like 17 million Americans are gluten-sensitive. However, it must be remembered that this is also big business. When literally billions of dollars are at stake, it's hard to trust anybody. So as always, best to stick to the science. What sort of evidence do we have for the existence of a condition presumed to be so widespread? Not much. The evidence base for such claims was unfortunately very thin, because we didn't have randomized controlled trials demonstrating that the entity even exists. The gold standard for confirming non-celiac gluten sensitivity requires a gluten-free diet followed by a double-blind randomized placebo-controlled food challenge. Uh, like you give someone a muffin, and they're not told if it's a gluten-free muffin or a gluten-filled muffin to control for placebo effects and see what happens. 
The reason this is necessary is because when you actually do this, a number of quote-unquote gluten-sensitive patients don't react at all to disguised gluten, and instead react to the gluten-free placebo, <laughs> so it truly was in their heads. But we never had that kind of level of evidence until 2011 when a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial was published which tested to see if patients complaining of irritable bowel-type symptoms who claimed they felt better on a gluten-free diet, despite not having celiac disease, actually could tell if they were given gluten-free um, uh, uh, bread and muffins or gluten-containing bread and muffins. They started out gluten-free and symptom-free for two weeks, and then they were challenged with the bread and muffins. Here's what happened to the 15 patients who got the placebo, meaning they started out on a gluten-free diet and continued on a gluten-free diet, they got worse. Just the thought that they may be eating something that was bad for them made them feel all crampy and bloated. This is what's called a nocebo effect. The placebo effect is when you give someone something useless and they feel better. The nocebo effect is when you give someone something harmless and they feel worse. But the small group that got the actual gluten felt worse still. So they concluded this non-celiac gluten intolerance may actually exist. It was a small study, though, and even though they claimed the gluten-free bread and muffins were indistinguishable, maybe at some level the patients could tell which is which. So in 2012, researchers in Italy took 920 patients that had been diagnosed with non-celiac gluten sensitivity and put them to the test with a double-blinded wheat challenge by giving them not bread and muffins, but capsules filled with wheat flour or filled with placebo flour, or kind of placebo powder, no flour at all. And more than two-thirds failed the test, uh, like they got uh, worse on the placebo or better on the wheat. But of those that passed, there was a clear benefit to staying on the wheat-free diet, confirming the existence of a non-celiac wheat sensitivity. Now, note they said wheat sensitivity, not gluten sensitivity. Gluten itself may not be causing gut symptoms at all. See, most people with wheat sensitivity have a variety of other food sensitivities. Uh, Two-thirds are sensitive to cow's milk protein as well. Then eggs were the most common culprit after that. So if you put people on a diet low in common triggers of irritable bowel symptoms and then challenge them with gluten, there's no effect. Same increase in symptoms with high gluten, low gluten, or no gluten. Right? calling into question the very existence of non-celiac gluten sensitivity. Interestingly, despite being informed that avoiding gluten wasn't apparently doing, them, uh, doing a thing for their gut symptoms, many participants opted to continue following a gluten-free diet as they just subjectively described feeling better. So the researchers wondered if avoiding gluten might be improving the mood of those with wheat sensitivity, and indeed, short-term exposure to gluten appeared to induce feelings of depression in these patients. But whether non-celiac gluten sensitivity is a disease of the mind or the gut, it is no longer a condition that can be dismissed. Until only a few years ago, almost the whole of the scientific world maintained that the wheat protein gluten would provoke negative effects only in people with rare conditions, such as celiac disease or wheat allergies. But by the early part of 2013, it was largely becoming accepted that some non-celiac patients could suffer from gluten or wheat sensitivity. And indeed, a consensus panel of experts now officially recognizes three gluten-related conditions, wheat allergy, celiac disease, and gluten sensitivity. So what percent of the population should avoid wheat? Well, about one in a thousand may have a wheat allergy. Uh, nearly one in a hundred may have celiac disease. And it appears to be on the rise, uh, though there's still less than about a 1 in 10,000 chance Americans will get diagnosed with celiac in any given year. How common is wheat or gluten sensitivity? Our best estimate at this point is that in that, it's in that same kind of general range, slightly higher than 1%, 
But still, that's potentially millions of people who may have been suffering for years, who could have been cured by simple dietary means, yet went unrecognized and unhelped by the medical profession. Although gluten sensitivity continues to gain medical credibility, we still don't know how it works, or how much gluten can be tolerated, if it's uh, reversible or not, and what the long-term complications might be of not sticking to the diet. Considering the lack of knowledge, maybe people with gluten sensitivity should be trying to reintroduce gluten back into their diet every year or so to see if it's still causing problems. The reason health professionals don't want to see people on gluten-free diets unless absolutely necessary is that for the 98% of people that don't have gluten issues, whole grains, including the gluten grains, wheat, barley, and rye, are health-promoting, a link to uh, reduced risk of coronary heart disease, cancer, diabetes, obesity, and other chronic diseases. You know, just like because some people have a peanut allergy doesn't mean that everyone should avoid peanuts. There's no evidence to suggest that following a gluten-free diet has any significant benefits in the general population. Indeed, there is some evidence to suggest that a gluten-free diet may adversely affect gut health in those without celiac disease or gluten sensitivity or allergy. They're talking about this study that found that a month on a gluten-free diet may hurt our gut flora and immune function, potentially setting those on gluten-free diets up for an overgrowth of harmful bacteria in their intestines. Why? Because ironically of the beneficial effects of the very components wheat of people have problems with, like the FODMAP fructans that act as prebiotics and feed our good bacteria, or the gluten itself, which may boost immune function. Less than a week of added gluten protein significantly increases natural killer cell activity, which uh, could be expected to improve our body's ability to fight cancer and viral infections. High gluten bread improves triglyceride be levels better than regular gluten bread, as another example. Ironically, one of the greatest threats of gluten-free diets may be the gluten itself. Self-prescription of a gluten-free diet may undermine our ability to pick up celiac disease, the much more serious form of gluten intolerance. Uh, the way we diagnose celiac is by looking for the inflammation caused by gluten in celiac sufferers. But if they haven't been eating a lot of gluten, we might miss the disease. Hence, rather than being on a gluten-free diet, we want celiac su suspects uh, to be on a gluten-loaded diet. We're talking four to six slices of gluten-packed bread a day, every day, for at least a month, so we can definitively diagnose the disease. Why does it matter so much to get a formal diagnosis if you're already on a gluten-free diet? Well, it's a genetic disease, so you'll know to test the family. But most importantly, many people on gluten-free diets are not actually on gluten-free diets. Even 20 parts per million can be toxic to someone with celiac. Many on so-called gluten-free diets inadvertently still eat gluten. Uh, sometimes there's contamination of gluten-free products, so even foods labeled quote-unquote gluten-free may still not be safe for celiac sufferers. That's why we need to know. The irony, editorialized in a prominent medical journal, of many celiac patients not knowing their diagnosis, while millions of non-sufferers banish gluten from their diets, can be considered a public health farce. Symptoms of gluten sensitivity include irritable bowel-type symptoms such as bloating, abdominal pain, and changes in bowel habits, as well as systemic manifestations such as brain fog, headache, fatigue, depression, joint and muscle aches, numbness in the extremities, a skin rash, or anemia. If those who suspect they might be gluten sensitive should not go on a gluten-free diet, what should they do? The first thing is a formal evaluation for celiac disease, which currently involves blood tests and small intestinal biopsy. If that's positive, then one goes on a gluten-free diet. But if it's negative, we should try eating a healthier diet— more fruits and vegetables, more whole grains and beans, while avoiding processed junk. See, in the past, the gluten-free diet had many benefits over the traditional American diet because it required increasing food and vegetable intake. So no wonder people felt better eating gluten-free. No more uh, deep-fried Twinkies uh, couldn't eat in fast food restaurants. Now, though, there's just as much gluten-free junk out there. 
I call it the vegan donut phenomenon. A few decades ago, vegans were forced to eat healthy, eat actual vegetables. But now they can eat their cheesy puffs while waiting for their candy-coated chocolate marshmallows to deep-fry in vegan bacon grease. If a healthy diet doesn't help, then I might add another step here, and that is to try to rule out other causes of chronic intestinal distress. When researchers study PWOGs, that's what they're called in the literature, people who avoid wheat and or gluten, in a study of 84 PWOGs, about a third didn't appear to have gluten sensitivity at all, but instead an overgrowth of bacteria in their small intestine, or were uh, fructose or lactose intolerant, or had a neuromuscular disorder like gastroparesis or pelvic floor dysfunction. When those are all ruled out as well, then I'd suggest people suffering from chronic suspicious symptoms try a gluten-free diet. And if symptoms improve, stick with it, though maybe re-challenging with gluten periodically. Unlike celiac disease, a gluten-free diet has begun uh, not to prevent serious complications from an autoimmune reaction, but just to resolve gluten sensitivity symptoms to try to improve patients' quality of life. However, a gluten-free diet itself can reduce quality of life, so it's a matter of trying to continually strike the balance. Uh, for example, gluten-free foods can be expensive, uh, averaging about triple the cost, and so most people would benefit more from buying an extra bunch of kale or blueberries instead. No current data suggests that the general population should maintain a gluten-free lifestyle, but for those with a celiac disease, wheat allergy, or sensitivity diagnosis, gluten-free diets can be a lifesaver. I've talked previously about the anti-diabetic and anti-obesity effects of various phytochemicals in beans, but there are protective effects on the cardiovascular system as well. Plant-specific compounds can have a remarkable impact on the healthcare system, may provide therapeutic health benefits, including the prevention and or treatment of diseases and disorders. Antioxidant effects, anti-inflammatory, liver protective, blood cholesterol lowering, blood pressure lowering, as well as prevention of aging, diabetes, osteoporosis, DNA damage, heart disease, and other disorders. Those without legumes in their daily diet, for example, may be at quadruple the odds of suffering high blood pressure. Legumes, such as chickpeas, have been used to treat high blood pressure and diabetes for thousands of years. Here's what they can do to our cholesterol levels. Researchers took people on a diet high enough in fat to rival the cholesterol levels in the Western world, up around 206, swapped in chickpeas for the grains that they were eating, and in five months their cholesterol dropped about 20% to 160, almost down to the target, which is around 150. A reduction of more than 15% in most of the subjects, and its sustained action during long-term administration not only indicate a definite benefit, but show that chickpeas are superior to many cholesterol-lowering substances. In a randomized crossover trial, adding two servings a day of lentils, chickpeas, beans, or split peas cut cholesterol levels so much that many participants move below the range at which statin drugs are typically prescribed. But I'm going to go back to this study, because they really buried the lead. The participants were started out on a low-fat diet, really low-fat, and so their cholesterol started out at 123, well within the safety zone. Only after packing their diet with saturated fat were they able to boost their cholesterol up to you know, typical American levels, which could then be ameliorated by adding chickpeas to their lousy new diet but it'd be better if they just stayed healthy in the first place, or even better, healthy and hummus, a healthy diet with lots of legumes. In just one decade, the number of people with diabetes has more than doubled. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, by 2050, one out of every three of us may have diabetes. What's the big deal? Well, the consequences of diabetes are legion. The number one cause of adult onset blindness, the number one cause of kidney failure, the number one cause of surgical amputations. What can we do to prevent it? Well, the onset of type 2 diabetes is gradual, with most individuals progressing through a state of prediabetes, a condition now striking 
approximately one in three Americans. But only about one in ten even knows it. Since current methods of treating diabetes remain inadequate, prevention is preferable, but what works better, lifestyle changes or drugs? We didn't know until this landmark study was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Thousands were randomized to get a good double dose of the leading anti-diabetes drug or diet and exercise. The drug, metformin, is probably the safest diabetes drug there is. Um, does cause diarrhea, and about half of those who take it makes one in four nauseous. About one in ten suffer from asthenia, uh, from the Greek meaning lack of strength, uh, causing physical weakness and fatigue. Uh, but the risk of being killed by the drug is only about one in 66,000 every year. And the drug worked. Compared to placebo, in terms of the percentage of people developing diabetes within the four-year study period, fewer people in the drug group developed diabetes. But diet and exercise alone worked better. The lifestyle intervention reduced diabetes incidence by 58%, compared to only 31% with the drug. The lifestyle intervention was significantly more effective than the drug, and had fewer side effects. More than three-quarters of those on the drug reported gastrointestinal symptoms, though there was more muscle soreness reported in the lifestyle group, on account they were actually exercising. Other studies subsequently found the same result. Non-drug approaches, superior to drug-based approaches for diabetes prevention. And the 50% or so drop in risk was not for people that actually improved their diet and lifestyle, but just those instructed to improve their diet and lifestyle, whether or not they actually did it. Check this out. This is one of the most famous diabetes prevention studies. 500 people with prediabetes randomized into a lifestyle intervention or control group. And during the trial, the risk of diabetes was reduced by that same 50 to 60%. But only a fraction of the patients met the modest goals. Right? Even in the lifestyle intervention group, only about a quarter were able to eat enough fiber, meaning whole plant foods, and cut down on enough saturated fat, which in this country is mostly dairy, dessert, chicken, and pork. But they did better than the control group, and fewer of them developed diabetes because of it. But what if you looked just at the folks that actually made the lifestyle changes, met at least four out of five of those wimpy goals? They had zero diabetes. None of them got diabetes, 100% drop in risk. Bottom line, type 2 diabetes can be prevented by changes in lifestyle, even in high-risk prediabetic subjects. The fact, then, that type 2 diabetes, a largely preventable disorder, has reached such epidemic proportion is a public health humiliation. Prediabetes is not just a high-risk state for the development of diabetes. Prediabetes can be a disease in itself. People with prediabetes may already have damage to their eyes, kidneys, blood vessels, and heart. Evidence from numerous studies suggests that the chronic complications of type 2 diabetes start to develop during the prediabetic state. So by the time we have prediabetes, it may already be too late to prevent organ damage. So best to prevent prediabetes in the first place, and the earlier the better. Thirty years ago, virtually all diabetes in young individuals was thought to be autoimmune type 1 diabetes. But since the mid-90s, we started seeing an increase in type 2 diabetes among our youth, particularly in the United States. Indeed, the term adult-onset diabetes has now been scrapped and replaced with type 2, because children as young as 8 are now developing the disease and the effects can be devastating. A 15-year-old follow-up of children diagnosed with type 2 diabetes found an alarming rate in young adults of blindness, amputation, kidney failure, and death in young adulthood. Why the dramatic rise in childhood diabetes? Because of the dramatic rise in childhood obesity. During the past 30 years, the number of children diagnosed as being overweight has increased more than 100%. Once an obese child reaches 6, they're likely to stay that way. 
and even if they don't, being overweight in our youth predicts adult disease and death regardless of adult body weight, even if we lose it. Being an overweight teen may predict disease risk 55 years later, twice the risk of dying from a heart attack, more cancer, gout, arthritis. In fact, being overweight as a teen was a more powerful predictor of these risks than being overweight in adulthood. This underscores the importance of focusing on preventing childhood obesity. So how do we do it? From the official American Academy of Pediatrics Clinical Practice Guidelines, the problem appears to be kids eating too much fat and added sugars and not eating enough fruits and vegetables. Doctors at every occasion, beginning soon after a child's birth, should endeavor to give sound advice regarding nutrition and growth so uh, that obesity and its complications may be curtailed. What might sound advice sound like? Well, the chair of the nutrition department at Loma Linda University published a paper suggesting not eating meat at all might be an effective strategy. Population studies have consistently shown that vegetarians are thinner than comparable non-vegetarians. This is uh, from the largest such study to date. A body mass index of over 30 is considered obese, 25 to 30 overweight, and under 25 ideal weight. The non-vegetarians were up at 28.8. The average meat eater in the U.S. is significantly overweight. As one gets more and more plant-based, the average BMI drops. But even the average vegetarian in the U.S. is overweight. The only dietary group that was on average ideal weight were those eating strictly plant-based. So that comes out to be about a 33-pound difference between the vegans and the meat-eaters. Vegetarian children grow up not only thinner, but taller. Vegetarian kids grow to be about an inch taller than other kids. Uh, apparently, meat intake is somehow negatively associated with height. I can just hear the Dairy Council now saying, oh, it's because of all the milk the veggie kids must be drinking. No. The veg kids consume significantly less dairy and much lower animal protein intake overall. Meat intake is apparently associated with growing wider, though in school-aged children the consumption of animal foods, meat, dairy, or eggs, is associated with an increased risk of overweight, whereas plant-based equivalents like veggie burgers, veggie dogs, veggie cold cuts were not, and whole plant foods like grains, beans, and nuts were found to be protective. This may be because plant-based diets are low in energy density, high in starch, fiber, and water, which may increase feelings of fullness, and resting energy expenditure, meaning resting metabolic rate. Eating plant-based appears to boost metabolism, so we just kind of burn more calories at rest, even you know, when you're sleeping. However, we're not sure how much of the benefits are due to increased consumption of plant foods versus the decreased consumption of meat. Either way, plant-based diets should be encouraged and promoted for optimal health. Local, national, international food policies are warranted to support social marketing messages and to reduce the social, cultural, economic, and political forces that make it difficult to promote such diets. For example, although the advice to consume a plant-based diet is sound, questions arise regarding the relative high price of produce. Yes, we can reduce the burden of childhood obesity, prevent the further threat of spread of disease, but we need to ensure that plant foods are affordable and accessible to children of all income levels. Fruits and vegetables may not fit on the dollar menu, but our kids are worth it. Getting diabetes in childhood cuts nearly 20 years off their life. Who among us wouldn't go to the ends of the earth to enable our kids to live 20 years longer? As a rule, high-ranking public health officials try to avoid apocalyptic descriptors, so it's worrying to hear those like the director of the CDC warn of a coming health nightmare and a catastrophic threat. A number of prominent publications recently warn of the threat of antibiotic resistance. The CDC estimates that at a minimum more than 2 million people are sickened every year with antibiotic-resistant infections in the United States, with at least 23,000 dying as a result. 
we may be at the dawn of a post-antibiotic era. Achievements in modern medicine, such as surgery and the treatment of preterm babies, which we today take for granted, would not be possible without access to effective treatment for bacterial infections. For example, without antibiotics, the rate of post-operative infection after a procedure like a hip replacement would be 40 to 50 percent, and about one in three of those patients would die. That's like Russian roulette odds. So the so-called worst-case scenarios, where resistant infections could cost like $50 billion a year, might still be an underestimate. From cradle to grave, antibiotics have become pivotal in safeguarding the overall health of human society. So the dire phrasing from head officials may be warranted. There are now infections like carbapenem-resistant Enterobacter, resistant to nearly all antibiotics, even the so-called drugs of last resort. Worryingly, some of these last resort drugs are being used extensively in animal agriculture. According to the World Health Organization, more antibiotics are fed to farm animals than is used to treat disease in human patients. Doctors overprescribe antibiotics, but huge amounts of antibiotics are used in fish farming and other intensive animal agriculture, up to four times the amount used in human medicine. Why? Suboptimum growth to slaughter weight caused by unsanitary conditions can be compensated with by addition of antibiotics to feed. Instead of relieving any stressful, overcrowded, unhygienic conditions, it may be cheaper to just you know, dose the animals with drugs. In this way, factory farms are driving the growth of antibiotic-resistant organisms that cause human diseases. This may help bolster the industry's bottom line, but in the process, bacteria are developing antimicrobial resistance, which affects human health. In the United States, the FDA reports that 80% of antibiotics in the United States are used in food animals, mainly to promote growth in this kind of high-density production. This can select for antibiotic-resistant bacteria like methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, MRSA, or MRSA, considered a serious threat in the United States. These industrial pig operations may provide optimal conditions for the introduction and transmission of MRSA. U.S. pork producers are currently permitted to use 29 different antibiotic drugs in feed without a prescription. They're currently added to about 90% of pig starter feeds. When animals receive unnecessary antibiotics, bacteria can become resistant to the drugs, then travel on meat to the store, and end up causing hard-to-treat illnesses in people. MRSA present in retail raw meat may serve as a possible source of bacterial infections for food preparers in the food industry and the hands of consumers in the home, unless you wear gloves. Uh, once MRSA gets into our homes on meat, it can transfer to our cutting boards, knives, and onto our skin at a rate similar to the rate of transmission from touching an infected patient contaminated with MRSA. Washing of hands after touching raw pork is advised. Over the last 40 years, the burden of gout, a painful inflammatory arthritis, has risen considerably, now affecting millions of Americans. Gout is now the most common inflammatory arthritis in men and older women. In my video, Gout Treatment with a Cherry on Top, I profiled new research suggesting that even as little as a half a cup of cherries a day may significantly lower the risk of gout attacks. Uh, fresh cherries aren't always in season, though, so I listed a few alternatives, and frozen appeared second best with cherry juice concentrate, the runner-up. But does concentrated cherry juice actually help prevent attacks of gout? We didn't know until now. The first pilot study was a randomized controlled trial. Cherry juice concentrate versus pomegranate juice concentrate as a control for the prevention of attacks in gout sufferers who are having as many as four attacks a month. The cherry group got a tablespoon of cherry juice concentrate twice a day for four months, and the control group got a tablespoon of pomegranate juice concentrate twice a day for four months. The number of gout flares in the cherry group dropped from an average of 5 down to 2, better than the pomegranate group, which only dropped from about 5 to 4. Uh, 
And about half of those in the CHERRY group who were on prescription anti-inflammatory drugs were able to stop their medications within two months after starting the CHERRY juice, as opposed to none of the patients in the pomegranate juice group. The second study was a retrospective investigation over the longer term. 24 gout patients went from having about seven attacks a year down to two. The researchers conclude cherry juice concentrate is efficacious for the prevention of gout flares. Certainly large, long-term randomized controlled trials are needed to further evaluate the usefulness of cherries and cherry juice concentrate for gout flare prophylaxis, but in the meanwhile, are cherries now ripe for use as a complementary therapeutic in gout? This commentator is of the opinion that the current state of evidence remains insufficient to formally recommend cherry fruit or cherry products as a complementary therapeutic remedy for gout. Why not? Can you guess who this guy is? This commentator is also a paid consultant of nine different drug companies, all of which manufacture gout medications. I understand how the pharmaceutical industry can get nervous seeing studies where half of patients were able to stop taking their gout drugs, given the billions of dollars at stake. But what's the downside of eating a half a cup of cherries a day, or worse comes to worse, a few spoonfuls of cherry juice? Why don't more doctors practice preventive cardiology? Available time is a reason frequently cited by physicians, but if you probe a little deeper, yes, they complain about not having enough time to give their patients dietary advice. But the number one reason given was their perception that patients fear being deprived of all the junk they're eating. Can you imagine a doctor saying, yeah, I'd like to tell my patients to stop smoking, but I know how much they love it? Changes in diet to reduce cholesterol levels are often assumed to result in reductions in quality of life. Uh, do we get to live longer, or is it just going to feel longer? But contrary to popular belief, this study found no apparent reduction, but rather an improvement in some measures of quality of life and patient satisfaction using medical nutrition therapy as opposed to drugs for high cholesterol. Whereas people taking cholesterol-lowering drugs don't feel any different, this study found that those using dietary changes reported significantly better health and satisfaction and better life in general, more positive feelings, and fewer negative. In the family heart study, for example, those placed on a cholesterol-lowering diet showed significantly greater improvements in depression, as well as a reduction in aggressive hostility. Another barrier to preventive cardiology is that doctors don't realize how powerful dietary changes can be. The importance of diet for patients' health remains underestimated by doctors. Even the new drug-centered cholesterol guidelines emphasize that lifestyle modification should be the foundation for the reduction for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk. Yet more than half of physicians may skip over lifestyle change, completely jump straight to their prescription pad, doubting that cholesterol goals can be reached with lifestyle changes alone. According to the director of the famous Framingham Heart Study, the best way to manage coronary artery disease is to lower patients' LDL cholesterol and other atherosclerosis-causing particles. You can achieve this with diet plus drugs, but if you can do it with a vegetarian diet, it works even better. In the Framingham Heart Study, those running in the Boston Marathon achieved the goal of getting their total to good cholesterol ratio under 4, but the Vegetarians did even better. And if you go all out, putting people on a very high fiber, whole food, vegetable, fruit, and nut diet, you can get a 25% drop in the bad to good uh, cholesterol ratio within one week, a 33% drop in LDL. That's the cholesterol reduction equivalent to a therapeutic dose of a cholesterol-lowering statin drug. Blood cholesterol concentration is clearly increased by adding dietary cholesterol. In other words, putting cholesterol in our mouth means putting cholesterol in our blood. And it may also potentiate the harmful effects of saturated fats, meaning when we eat sausage and eggs, the eggs may make the effects of the sausage even worse. If we ate the saturated fat and cholesterol found in two sausage and egg McMuffins every day for two weeks, our cholesterol would shoot up nearly 30 points. 
But if we ate the same amount of saturated fat without the cholesterol, some kind of cholesterol-free sausage McMuffins, without the egg, what would happen? Now, the egg would have saturated fat too, so to even it out we'd have to add three strips of bacon to this side. So same saturated fat, but two eggs worth less cholesterol would only bump us up to here. So yes, saturated fat may increase fasting cholesterol levels more than dietary cholesterol, but especially in the presence of dietary cholesterol. And this is measuring fasting cholesterol, meaning the baseline from which all our meal-related cholesterol spikes would then shoot. Heart disease has been described as a postprandial phenomenon, meaning an after-meal phenomenon. Milky little droplets of fat and cholesterol straight from a meal, called chylomicrons, can build up in atherosclerotic plaques just like LDL cholesterol. So what happens after a meal that includes eggs? Here's what happens to the level of fat and cholesterol in our bloodstream for the seven hours after eating a meal with no fat, no cholesterol. Hardly any changes at all. But now a meal with fat and more and more egg. Triglycerides shoot up, and blood cholesterol shoots up. That's the kind of data that's bad for egg sales. So how could one design a study to hide this fact? Well, what if we only measured fasting cholesterol levels in the morning, seven hours after supper? You wouldn't see a big difference between those that ate eggs the night before and those that didn't. As the lead investigator of that uh, study that compared smoking to egg consumption pointed out, you know, measuring fasting cholesterol is appropriate for measuring the effects of drugs, suppressing our liver's cholesterol production, but not appropriate for measuring the effects of dietary cholesterol. After a cholesterol-laden supper, look what our arteries are being pummeled with all night long. And think about the day. How many hours are there between meals? Maybe four hours between breakfast and lunch? So if we had eggs for breakfast, we'd get that big spike, and by lunch start the whole cycle of fat and cholesterol in our arteries all over again. Most of our lives are lived in a postprandial state, in an after-meal state. And this shows that the amount of cholesterol in those meals— they actually used eggs in this study— so the amount of egg in our meals makes a big difference when it matters, after we've eaten, which is where we spend most of our lives. So that's why when the egg board funds a study, they only measure fasting cholesterol levels the next day, way out here somewhere. This is one of the craziest articles I saw all year. A single consumption of high amounts of Brazil nuts improves the cholesterol levels of healthy volunteers. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, they gave 10 men and women a single meal containing 0, 1, 4, or 8 Brazil nuts, and found that the ingestion of just that single serving almost immediately improved cholesterol levels. LDL, so-called bad cholesterol levels in the blood, were significantly lower starting just 9 hours after the ingestion of nuts, and by no insignificant amount, nearly 20 points within a day. Even drugs don't work that fast. Take statins like four days to have a significant effect. But that's not even the crazy part. They went back and measured their cholesterol five days later, and then 30 days later. Now keep in mind, they weren't eating Brazil nuts this whole time. They just had that single serving a month before, and their cholesterol was still down 30 days later. It went down and stayed down after eating just four nuts. That's nuts! And no, the study was not funded by the Brazil nut industry. Interestingly, four nuts actually seemed to work faster than the eight nuts to lower bad cholesterol and boost good cholesterol. These results suggest that eating just four nuts might be enough to improve the levels of LDL and HDL for up to 30 days, and maybe longer. They didn't even test past 30. Now, normally when a study comes out in the medical literature showing some too-good-to-be-true result like this, you want to wait to see the results replicated before you change your clinical practice, uh, before you recommend something to your patients, particularly when the study is done on only 10 people, and especially when the findings are literally just too incredible to be believed. But when the intervention is cheap, easy, harmless, and healthy, eating four Brazil nuts a month, then in my opinion the burden of proof 
is kind of reversed. I think the reasonable default position is to do it until proven otherwise. So now every month I eat four Brazil nuts. In conclusion, a single serving is sufficient without producing liver or kidney toxicity. I should hope not. Uh, but what they're referring to is the high selenium content of Brazil nuts, so high that four eaten every day might actually bump up against a tolerable daily limit for selenium, but not something we have to worry about if we're just eating four once a month. When the history of the world's attempt to address obesity is written, the greatest failure may be collaboration with and appeasement of the food industry. For instance, Yum Brands, who owns Kentucky Fried Chicken, linked up with a leading U.S. breast cancer charity to sell pink buckets of fried chicken. Save the Children, an organization aiming to positively change the lives of children, was initially a staunch supporter of soda taxes, but recently the organization withdrew its support, saying that support of the soda taxes did not fit the way Save the Children works. Perhaps it's only a coincidence that it was seeking a grant from Coca-Cola, and it accepted millions from Pepsi. Through these partnerships, the food industry seeks to emphasize that inactivity, not the promotion and consumption of its calorie-rich products, is the prime cause of obesity. Studies like this, though, showing that obesity is rising even in areas where people are exercising more, are most likely explained by the fact that our physical activity levels are being outstripped by our eating activity levels. The message is plain. The primary driver of the obesity epidemic in the United States is now the food supply, and interventions targeting physical activity are not going to resolve it. So, while physical activity is good regardless, it will not address most of the burden of ill health caused by obesity. This is going to require a new focus on the root cause of the problem, the American diet. At the heart of the energy inside of the obesity problem is the food and beverage industry. Put simply, the enormous commercial success enjoyed by the food industry is now causing what promises to be one of the greatest public health disasters of our time. As fast as we can rid the world of the microbial causes of pestilence and famine, they are replaced by new vectors of disease in the form of transnational food corporations that market salt, fat, sugar, and calories in unprecedented quantities. So policymakers should consider working on pricing strategies that subsidize the cost of healthier foods. First, we need to shift relative prices to make it more expensive to consume animal products compared to fruits, vegetables, and beans. Second, we need to increase demand for plant foods, which is not as easy given the hundreds of billions of dollars in annual subsidies our taxpayer dollars going to make animal products artificially cheap. The food industry will rail against the nanny state and fight tooth and nail for its right to market a range of options to responsible individuals able to make choices for themselves. It's the American way. Uh, for context, though, these arguments are no different to those used by the tobacco industry, which also markets habituating unhealthy products in pursuit of profit. In the case of tobacco, the American people have agreed that controls must be applied to limit the harms caused. Poor diet is now responsible for an even greater burden of disease than tobacco. And food industries must be controlled in the same way if the harms are to be reduced. As unpalatable as this may be, the food industry would do well to strengthen their public health conscience, given that consumers are always going to need their goods, something that cannot be said for the tobacco industry. You hear that a lot in the public health circles how we have to work with the companies, because unlike tobacco, we have to eat. But just like, yes, we have to breathe, but we don't need to breathe smoke, yes, we need to eat, but we don't need to eat junk. Dioxins are highly toxic pollutants, that accumulate in tissue fat. Almost all dioxins found in humans that aren't working at a toxic waste dump or something are believed to come from food, especially meat, milk, and fish, which account for probably about 95% of human exposure. Uh, we tend to only hear about it in the news, though, when there's some mass poisoning. 
1957, for example, millions of chickens began dying, uh, blamed on toxic components in certain feed fats. Uh, factory farming was taking off, and the industry needed cheap feed to fatten up the birds, and ended up using a toxic fleshing grease uh, from hide stripping operations in the leather industry that were using dioxin-containing preservatives. Uh, a subsequent outbreak in 69 resulted from a pipe mix-up at a refinery that was producing both pesticides and animal feed. In the 1990s, a supermarket survey found the highest concentrations of dioxins in farm-raised catfish. The source of dioxins was determined to be the feed, but that's surprising since catfish aren't fed a lot of animal fat. In fact, that's one of the reasons people eat catfish. They're so low on the food chain. It turns out it was dioxin-contaminated clay added to the feed as an anti-caking agent, uh, which may have originally come from sewage sludge. The same contaminated feed was fed to chickens, so what may have started out in sewage sludge ended up on the plates of consumers in the form of farm-raised catfish and chicken. How widespread of a problem did it become? 5% of U.S. poultry production. That's people eating hundreds of millions of contaminated chickens. And if it's in the chickens, it's in the eggs. Elevated dioxin levels in chicken eggs, too. When the source of the feed contamination was identified, the USDA estimated that less than 1% of animal feed was contaminated, but 1% of egg production means over a million eggs a day. But the catfish were the worst. More than a third of all U.S. farm-raised catfish were found contaminated with dioxins thanks to that ball clay. So the FDA requested that ball clay not be used in animal feeds. They even asked NICE, Dear producer or user of K-plot products in animal feeds, continued exposure to elevated dioxin levels in animal feed increases the risk of adverse health effects in those consuming animal-derived food products, chicken, eggs, and fish. So we are recommending that the use of ball clay in animal feeds be discontinued. They look forward to the industry's cooperation. So how cooperative did the industry end up being? Half a billion pounds of catfish continued to be churned out of U.S. fish farms every year, but only recently did the government go back and check. Published in 2013, samples of catfish were collected from all over the country. Dioxins were found in 96% of samples tested. Yeah, but just because catfish are bought in the U.S. doesn't mean they come from the U.S. And indeed, some of the catfish were imported from China or Taiwan, but they were found to be 10 times less contaminated than the U.S. catfish. And indeed, when they checked the feed fed to U.S. catfish, more than half the feed sampled were contaminated. And so it seems that mined clay products are still being used in U.S. catfish feeds. Even just small amounts of mineral clays added to fish feeds, together with the fact that catfish can be bottom feeders, uh, may lead to higher than acceptable dioxin residues in the final catfish products. Maybe the government should ask nicely again and wait another 16 years to retest. The Institute of Medicine suggests strategies to reduce dioxin intake exposure, such as trimming fat uh, from meat, poultry, and fish, and avoiding the recycling of animal fat into gravy. But if almost all dioxin intake comes from animal fat, then eating a more plant-based diet could wipe out about 98% of exposure. Thus, a vegetarian diet, or even just eating more plants, might have previously unsuspected health advantages, along with the more commonly recognized uh, cardiovascular benefits and decreased cancer risk. The United States has one of the highest premature birth rates in the world, now ranking 131st worldwide. Even worse, over the last few decades, the rate of preterm birth in the U.S. has been going up. We've known that preterm delivery is associated with significant problems during infancy and almost three-quarters of all infant deaths, but even preemies who survive past infancy can carry a legacy of health issues, such as behavioral problems, 
uh, and uh, moderate to severe neurodevelopmental disabilities and psychiatric disorders in half of those born extremely preterm by the time they reach school age. There's even evidence now that adults born very premature at increased risk for things like heart disease and diabetes. And babies don't even have to be born that premature to suffer long-term effects. Even so-called near-term births at 36 or 37 weeks are now thought to be related to subtle developmental problems. So what can pregnant women do to decrease this risk? I've talked about avoiding aspartame and diet soda consumption during pregnancy, but what about food? 66,000 pregnant women were studied to examine whether an association exists between maternal dietary patterns and risk of preterm delivery. They compared a so-called prudent diet, which was more plant-based, versus a Western diet or traditional Scandinavian diet, and found that the prudent pattern was associated with significantly reduced risk of preterm delivery. Their findings suggest that diet matters. Uh, but why and how? Well, Inflammation is thought to play a role in triggering delivery, and so a diet characterized by anti-inflammatory foods, high intakes of you know, vegetables, fruits, and berries, can reduce both systemic and local inflammation, and the lower saturated fat levels may also be associated with reduced inflammation. Any good foods in particular? Well, uh, since a significant percentage of preterm deliveries are thought to be related to infections and inflammatory conditions in the genital tract, what about looking into garlic. Garlic is associated, is well known for its antimicrobial properties, and also has these prebiotic dietary fibers that feed our good bacteria. Speaking of which, dried fruit packed with fiber also have some antimicrobial activities against some of the bacteria suspected to play a role in preterm delivery. So they studied the garlic, onion, and dried fruit intake of nearly 19,000 pregnant women, and indeed they observed a reduced risk of spontaneous preterm delivery related to groups of garlic and onion family vegetables and dried fruit. In particular, uh, garlic stood out for the vegetables and raisins for the dried fruit, associated with a reduced risk of both preterm delivery and preterm prelabor rupture of membranes, which means uh, your water breaking prematurely before 37 weeks. And it didn't seem to take much. The so-called high garlic intake associated with the lowest risk was just about one clove a week or more. And High raisin intake was defined as just like one of those little mini snack boxes of raisins a month. There are anti-inflammatory drugs that may reduce the risk of Alzheimer's disease, but stomach, liver, and kidney toxicity precludes their widespread use. So maybe using an anti-inflammatory food, like the spiced turmeric found in curry powder, could offer the benefits without the risks? Uh, before even considering putting it to the test, though, one might ask, well, do populations that eat a lot of turmeric have a lower prevalence of dementia? They may actually have the lowest reported prevalence of dementia in Alzheimer's. Okay, so far so good. But maybe because it's such an impoverished area that people just don't live very long. So you need to know more than just prevalence, how many Alzheimer's cases are walking around, but the incidence of the disease, how many new people are coming down with it every year, which reflects the kind of true rate of disease occurrence. In rural Pennsylvania, the incidence rate of Alzheimer's disease among seniors is 19. 19 people in 1,000 over age 65 develop Alzheimer's every year in rural Pennsylvania. In rural India, using the same diagnostic criteria, that same rate is 3, confirming they have among the lowest reported Alzheimer's rates in the world. Although there isn't much to go on, the lower prevalence of Alzheimer's in India is generally attributed to the turmeric consu consumption as part of curry, and it's assumed that people who use turmeric regularly have a lower incidence of the disease, but let's not just assume. A thousand people tested, and those who consume curry, at least occasionally, did do better on simple cognitive tests than those that didn't. Those that ate curry often had only about half the odds of showing cognitive impairment after adjusting for a wide variety of potential confounding factors. This suggests that curry consumption may be associated with better cognitive performance. Of course, it probably matters what's being curried. Are we talking chicken masala or 
chana masala with chickpeas instead of chicks. It may be no coincidence that the country with the, among the lowest rates of Alzheimer's has among the lowest rates of meat consumption, with a significant chunk of the population eating meat-free and egg-free diets. We've known uh, for over 20 years now that those who eat meat, red meat or white meat, appear between two to three times more likely to become demented compared to vegetarians. And the longer one eats meat-free, the lower the associated risk of dementia, whether or not you curry favor with your brain. What about treating Alzheimer's disease with the spiced turmeric? An exciting case series was published in 2012. Three Alzheimer's patients treated with turmeric, and their symptoms declined along with the burden on their caregivers. Let me show you what these data mean in real lives. Case number one, 83-year-old woman started losing her memory, getting disoriented. Then she started having problems taking care of herself, wandering aimlessly, incontinent. After the turmeric, though, her agitation, apathy, anxiety, and irritability were relieved. She had less accidents. Furthermore, she began to laugh again and sing again, and knit again. After taking turmeric for more than a year, she came to recognize her family, and now lives a peaceful life without a significant behavioral or psychological symptom of dementia. Case 2 was similar, but with hallucinations and delusions and depression, which appeared relieved by turmeric. She began to recognize her family again, and now lives in a peacefully serene manner. And the third case, similar, as well, including an improvement in cognition. The first demonstration that turmeric may be effective and safe for the treatment of the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia in Alzheimer's disease patients. They call it a drug, but it's just a spice you could walk into any grocery store and buy for a few bucks. They were giving people like a teaspoon a day, which comes out to be about 15 cents. Two trials using curcumin supplements rather than turmeric, however, failed to show a benefit. Curcumin is just one of hundreds of phytochemicals found in uh, turmeric. Concentrated into pill form at up to 40 times the dose, no evidence of efficacy was found. Why didn't they get the same dramatic results we saw in the three case reports? Well, those three cases may have been total flukes, but on the other hand, turmeric the whole food is greater than the sum of its parts. There's a long list of compounds that have been isolated from turmeric, and it's possible that each component in the mixture of curcumin-like compounds plays a distinct role in making it useful in Alzheimer's disease, and hence a mixture of compounds might better represent turmeric and its medicinal value better than curcumin alone. But why concoct some artificial mixture when Mother Nature already did it for us with turmeric? because you can't patent the spice. And if you can't patent it, how are you going to charge more than 15 cents? In my Research into Reversing Aging video, I highlighted Dean Ornish's landmark study showing that a low-fat, whole foods, plant-based diet, high in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, along with walking, stress management, and support, could not only reverse heart disease, open up arteries without drugs and surgery, and potentially reverse the progression of early-stage prostate cancer, but was the first intervention ever shown to increase telomerase activity, the enzyme that builds and maintains these caps at the tips of our chromosomes, called telomeres, which appear to slow the aging of our cells. Yes, this new finding was exciting and should encourage people to adopt a healthy lifestyle in order to avoid or combat cancer and age-related diseases, but uh, was it the diet, the exercise, or the stress management? That's what researchers have been trying to tease out in the six years since the study was published. Let's look at stress first. In the film The Holiday, Cameron Diaz exclaimed, severe stress caused the DNA in our cells to shrink until they can no longer replicate. Did Hollywood get the science right? Do people who are stressed have shorter telomeres? To answer that question, researchers measured the telomere lengths in mothers of chronically ill children. What could be more stressful than that? The longer a woman had spent being the main carer of her ill child, 
the shorter were her telomeres. The extra telomere shortening in these stressed mothers was equivalent to that caused by at least a decade of aging. We see the same thing in caregivers of Alzheimer's patients, and in those suffering severe work-related exhaustion. Even those abused as children may grow up with shorter telomeres. Not much we can do about our past, but if we manage our stress, can we grow some of our telomeres back? Well, if you go off to a meditation retreat and meditate for 500 hours, you can indeed boost your telomerase activity. 600 hours of meditation may be beneficial as well. But come on, there's got to be a quicker fix, and this exciting new study delivered. Caregivers of family members with dementia randomized to just 12 minutes of daily meditation for eight weeks, so just about 10 hours in total, experienced significant benefit better mental and psychological function accompanied by an increase in telomerase activity, suggesting improvement in stress-induced cellular aging. What about exercise for slowing cellular aging? Stress management help, but we can't always change our station in life, but we can always go out for a walk. Researchers studied 2,400 twins, and those that exercised more pumped up their telomeres along with their muscles. These were mostly folks in their 40s. Uh, does it still work in our 50s? Yes, those habitual ex exercisers were working out three hours a week better than the younger group. The heavy exercise group here was only averaging a half an hour a day. What happens if you study hardcore athletes? Here's the telomere lengths of young, healthy, regular folks at around age 20, and then age 50, which is what you'd expect. Our telomeres get eaten away as we age, but what about the athletes? They started out in the same boat, nice, long, young, healthy telomeres capping all their chromosomes, and then at age 50, they appear to still have the chromosomes of a 20-year-old. But these were marathon runners, triathletes, running 50 miles a week for 35 years. That's worse than the meditation retreat study. And it doesn't help us with the original question. What was it about the Ornish intervention that so powerfully protected telomeres after just three months? We saw that just stress management seemed to help, but what about the diet versus exercise? Was it the plant-based diet? Was it the walking 30 minutes a day, or was it just because of the weight loss? In those three months, participants lost about 20 pounds. Maybe our telomeres are happy if we lose 20 pounds using any method, starting a cocaine habit, getting tuberculosis, whatever. To answer this critical question, was it the plant-based diet specifically, the exercise, or the weight loss, ideally you do a study where you randomize people into at least three groups, a control group, that did nothing, sedentary with a typical diet, a group that just exercised, and a group that lost weight eating pretty much the same diet, but just in smaller portions. And I'm happy to report in 2013 just such a study was published. They took 400 women and randomized them into four groups, a portion-controlled diet group, an exercise group, and a portion-controlled diet and exercise group for a full year. And here they are. This is how long the telomeres were at baseline. After a year of doing nothing, there was essentially no change in the control group, which is what we'd expect. The exercise group was no wimpy, ornish 30-minute stroll, but 45 minutes, moderate to vigorous exercise like jogging. After a year of that, how did they do? They did no better. What about just the weight loss? Nothing and exercise and weight loss, no significant change either. So as long as we're eating the same lousy diet, it doesn't appear to matter how small our portions are, or how much weight we lose, or how hard we exercise. After a year, they saw no benefit. Whereas the Ornish group on the plant-based diet lost the same amount of weight after just three months, exercising less than half as hard, and saw significant telomere protection. So it wasn't the weight loss, it wasn't the exercise, it was the food. 
What about a plant-based diet is so protective? Higher consumption of vegetables, less butter and more fruit. And from the latest review, foods high in fiber and vitamins. But the key may be avoiding saturated fat. Swapping just 1% of saturated fat calories in a diet for anything else can add nearly a whole year of aging's worth of length onto our telomeres. Researchers have calculated how much our telomeres we may shave off per serving of foods like ham or hot dogs, bologna, salami, or other lunch meats. Fish consumption was also significantly associated with shortened telomeres. Saturated fats like palmitic acid, the primary saturated fat in salmon and found in meat, eggs, and dairy in general, can actually be toxic to cells. This has been demonstrated in heart cells, uh, bone marrow cells, pancreatic cells, brain cells. And the toxic effects on cell death rates happen right around what you see in the bloodstream of people who eat a lot of animal products. It may not be the saturated fat itself, though saturated fat may just be a marker for the increased oxidative stress and inflammation associated with animal-derived foods. With this link to saturated fat, no wonder lifelong low cholesterol levels has been related to longer telomeres and a smaller proportion of short telomeres. In other words, markers of slower biological aging with lower cholesterol. In fact, there's a rare congenital birth defect called progeria syndrome, where children essentially age 8 to 10 times faster than normal, and it seems associated with a, particularly in a particular inability to handle animal fats. Um, in this case report, they started trying to lower her cholesterol starting at age 2, but uh, sadly she died sh shortly after this uh, picture was taken at age 10. The good news is that even if we've been beating up on our telomeres, despite past accumulated injury leading to shorter telomere length, current healthy behaviors may help to decrease our risk of some of the potential consequences like heart disease, eating more fruits and vegetables, and less meat, having more support from friends and families to attenuate the association between shorter telomeres and the ravages of aging. To summarize, here's a schematic of this constant battle. Inflammation, oxidation, damage, and dysfunction constantly hacking away at our telomeres. At the same time, our antioxidant defenses, a healthy diet, exercise, stress reduction, are constantly rebuilding them. Telomere length shortens with age. Progressive shortening of our telomeres leads to cell death or transformation to cancer, affecting the health and lifespan of an individual. But the rate at which telomere shortening can be either increased or decreased by specific lifestyle factors, a better choice of diet and activities has great potential to reduce the rate of telomere shortening or at least prevent excessive telomere shrinkage, leading to delayed onset of age-related diseases and increased lifespan.